So, hello everybody. Uh, let's talk about scaling up with log for algorithms today. So, I uh, let me present myself. I for the things interesting here. I teach concurrent distributed programming in St. Petersburg ITMO, but we're not going uh, to go into deep theory of concurrent computing uh, today. Uh, today we're going to talk about scalability issues, and we'll, we'll see some uh, some some stuff. Um, I also work in Kotlin for JetBrains, so if you excuse me, my code examples will be in Kotlin, but I hopefully you'll, you, they'll be easier to understand for everybody. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm really curious about you guys. So who is, uh, first of all, uh, who has, obviously if you came here, probably been writing some concurrent code. Please raise your hands if you did. Okay. Okay. So, oh, I see. So, so the most of you didn't. So, and you, you come uh, to see what's going on. So, I, I'll help you today. So, today we're going to talk about shared mutable state, and that's kind of three words that really dread uh, people who really know what it's about, uh, because uh, when people who who programmed for 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 many years, when they hear the word shared mutable state, they they get different associations. Maybe something like this, you know, when it all crashes and blue screens, or maybe something like this. You know, that's that's kind of you know association with people here. Because shared mutable state with three things you you should never ever put together. You know, you can have mutability, you but by separately, you know, sharing separately. But when you do it all together, it's 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 become really hard. So if it's that bad, then why people is doing that? So why we have this shared middle state, and why Java supports it, why many other modern languages do support it? Why, do, why don't we go like and forbid it? Like there are some languages that do completely for, forbid you from having shared middle state. And the reason is actually really, really simple. Like if you look at the modern world and you have this uh, you know, bullshit word, big data, so I put it big, big data, and you have to do something with it, you know. Many times, the pr your problem that you're trying to solve is, can be represented with this pattern. You have this big data, you split it into batches, then you do some processing, which is called mapping the data, then you collect the results and get an answer. That's most of the problems are like that. And the problems are like that are called embarrassingly parallel. That's actually the actual technical term. The problems are called embarrassingly parallel. And because to solve them, I mean, they're easy to realize. And you, you don't have to, to go in this scary world of shared mutable state because, you know, n there's nothing shared here. You can scale it up, scale it out into cluster. You can write your regular data processing code. Let's framework that sits at the bottom. Take care about arranging all your operations, that's it. If, the, if your problem is like that, you're a happy guy, you, you, you don't have to be here. However, sometimes you have this big, big data, but it's also like real time or semi-real time. Oh, it changes all the time. Like, for example, stock quotations change all the time. Uh, you know, your inventory in a big company, uh, something like that, uh, you know, status of, users in social network. Like there's lots of data, it ch constantly changes. And you have lots of simultaneous requests coming to do something with this data. You know, compute it, your portfolio, uh, you know, get uh, real-time statuses for users in your social network, do something like that. And when you tr start trying to solve this problem in a both scalable and performant way, uh, there's simply no way to to solve it, which is both performant and scalable, without actually sharing this big data, which changes, which is mutable, between all the current concurrent processes that you have. Uh, I mean, if you uh, take the other approach, you just, okay, let's not share anything, you know, then you, it gets a massive duplication of data. I mean, massive. And if data changes in real time, you have to deliver it in all the copies, et cetera, a huge waste of resources. So many problems of this kind, can be only solved if you actually take this beta data, put it in some memory, and access it concurrently for all the requests that you have. And this is, of course, doing stuff like this is a really 
dark side, but I mean, we have to embrace this dark side when we, uh, when we work with it. I mean, there's simply no other way. So let's, uh, let's come forward to this dark side and uh, work with it. In order for this particular presentation, we have to, I have to illustrate you with some examples. So we'll have to pick some toy problem. And that's the hardest part. I mean, picking a toy problem to showcase concurrency because a toy problem is never, never a real problem. And uh, it will never show you the true problems that you'll encounter in real life. But for those, this particular toy problem, I've uh, picked a stack. The reason is simple. Most people know, know how stacks work. And uh, you know, it will let us uh, showcase some core concepts that we'll be working with. Uh, for stack, it's simple. We'll get a linking stack, so we'll have a node in a stack that has a next reference and a value of some type t. And I'm doing my, as I said, my examples in Kotlin, just because of Kotlin, this you know special language we invented, so our code fits on a slide, you know. And because if I do it in Java, you know, it's a full slide of code, and you know, in the, with Kotlin, I, I I can fit something else in addition to that, and that's what I need. So I, I won't be scaring you with Java anymore. Uh, so, uh, the stack is simple. So, how it works? You know, it starts with an empty stack that's uh, some top variable with their null pointer. Then we add an element to it, and its top points to it, and its next is null. Then we can add another one element to it, and then switch top to it. And that's a stack containing two elements, A and B. So, that's that's, that's real easy. So pushing elements in stack is easy, and we can easily write this code. I mean, we can just declare a class for a stack, or we can declare top variable, and our push is just one liner. Easy. Uh, not, not a big deal. So uh, that's our top, that's our push. So uh, how do we pop an item from the circ, right? So we examine what the uh, what the current element is at the top, and then we flip the top to the next one, and we read the result. Again, easy, and just how it looks, that's just the way it works. So this, which is especially, you know, concise in Kotlin, because, you know, I can, I can fold my null checks into this nice syntactical construct, so it's really, really, like everything fits on one slide. That's very simple stack implementation. So does it work? Of course it works if I do it serially. Like if I, if only one thread at a time works with my stack, if I don't share it, right? Everything works perfectly. But does it work if I actually share, right? If it's shared mutable state, if the stack is a part of share, maybe I'm doing, uh, maybe I'm doing a kind of, uh, for example, a pool of, for, for big objects or for my data. And pooling objects is easy to do with stacks. Like stack is a nice, nice data structure to do a pool of objects. So suppose I have a pool of some buffers or et cetera, put it in stack, and now I have this big parallel processing and my many threads needs to take items uh, from the pool and put back items into the pool. So, so what happens if two threads try to push into stack, right? So one of them comes, you know, reads the top, tries to add value B. Then the other comes, reads the top, tries to add element C. But now only one of them will succeed in updating the top, and the other one will rewrite the top from the first one. So we'll get, in the end, we'll get only, when two threads can currently push, we'll get only one of them added to the stack. And this is a common problem. This, it's technically called a conflict, and it's easy to solve in both Java and Kotlin. You just mark it synchronized. In Java, it's a keyword, you know, in, uh, in, the Kotlin is an annotation, but the concept is the same. By marking it synchronized, you, you ensure mutual exclusion between uh, different threads uh, that are trying to push and pop, and this way it prevents the, the problems that we saw. But the question we came here to, to understand, it does it scale? Okay, so I solved the problem, it now works, but does it scale? In order to figure out if it scales, we have to, uh, understand what scalability is and somehow measure it. To measure it, we'll just run a benchmark. And we'll use this, this nice uh, GMH framework that I would recommend anyone who is writing. Uh, benchmark is open source on, uh, yeah, open source, and I will have all the links at the end. It's open source on the, uh, 
on the uh, uh, Java side, so and uh, it, it's part of Open GDK. So I can just declare my benchmark, uh, which I have a shared stack, and I will have multiple threads just trying to push items and popping, making sure th th they pop in one. So the, the work, my workload is really simple, just a sequence push pop. I make sure that each of pushes and pops so stack doesn't grow indefinitely, it's just limited in size. And to measure how it scales, I run this benchmark uh, by varying the number of threads and run it. And in order to make it realistic, I have uh, went and rented uh, this, the largest Amazon uh, instance I could get my hands on. It's some extra large compute instance with, you know, Xeon processors, 32 hardware threads. So, uh, like, I think that, that that's how you run your real application, right? You'll, if you have lots of data, you will have like, this big machine, lots of memory, and lots of hardware threads. You'll load your data inside this machine, and you will start all your uh, data processing threads will start working with this data concurrently. So, the, and that's our model. That's basically this real two examples of model of that kind of real life processing. If so, I'm running this of real life looking machine, and that's what I get. Uh, what I get is that it's, it it does like 20 millions of these operations per second in one thread, but then if I add more threads, it doesn't become better. It's actually become worse. And it's especially worse in two threads, which is kind of interesting effect. When we have two threads, it's like the worst of the worst. But as we increase the number of threads, it kind of stabilizes. And, but still, it does not perform as well as if it were running just in a single thread. So definitely, this kind of problem in, in the solution to it is where adding more threads doesn't make it, uh, doesn't make it better, it doesn't let it uh, push more operations per second. So it's what's called doesn't scale. Why doesn't it kill? Because, because I think that it's technical contention. So because when one thread performs, for example, a pop, and the other thread in the middle of the pop comes and tries to do it, it can do it, it has to wait, because synchronized is a mutual exclusion concept. You know, we'll have to wait until the first pop completes, and only then we can pop an item from the stack. So that's, that's one, one problem with synchronization, which are usual uh, solution uh, to the concurrency is that under contention, we're starting to wait. We cannot do things concurrently, like really syn synchronized key work and logs. They uh, limit our concurrency because we have to things have to be done serially. More more so, it adds overhead because every time I uh, stumble into the log by other thread, I have to context switch. That's why it falls down under when we have multiple threads. It's not just stays flat, like we can push more operations per second. We actually, under contention, when we have lots of threads doing it, we're pushing less operations per second because there's extra overhead involved in managing all this switching. But that's just one problem with logs. The other problem with logs is dead logs. When we start writing, writing our application, uh, we synchronize with logs. Uh, as, as we add more and more locks in our apps, we add the contents risk in trying to dagged locks in the situation where, uh, you know, I cannot take a lock because it's taken by some other thread who turns out to be waiting for, for the lock that I keep. And that's, that, that's, that's the other scalability problem with locks, where scalability not in terms of how many hardware course I have, but scalability in terms of how large my project is. The larger my project becomes, the harder it uh, uh, becomes to maintain if I'm using locks in it. So that's why we're, for either of those problems, we'll turn our site into lock-free algorithms, algorithms that don't use locks to solve the same problem. And the, to understand how lock-free algorithms work, how they don't, uh, don't run into the problems with concurrency, but without using logs. Let's consider what prevents us from pushing uh, two items concurrently into the stacks. The problem is that when we've prepared to push an item, we expect that the top is still pointing uh, to the old item, and we want to update it to the new item we're inserting in the stack. If only we can do this operation atomically, making sure nobody else can interfere and add their element f faster than we did. 
And that's exactly this atomic update from expected uh, reference to the new one is is called is there is there's an A for such operation. The name is comparison set, and there is a class in Java called atomic reference that provides us such functionality. It's a, it's a class actually, in, you know, it's it's a part of GDK, so we can use it from any JVM language. On this example, uh, we'll be uh, in the following slides using it from. Kotlin, because it, it's just a class we can use, and uh, inside it contains a volatile uh, variable. You can get it, or you can compare and set it. A compare and set is that's atomic update. I'm updating variable mm, uh, under condition that nobody else has, uh, has uh, changed it. It's still equal to the expected value. It's available since ages, since 1.5. And I mean, it, it's really pretty a long time ago, 1.5, and uh, Java was the first uh, language, major language, who kind of standardized such operations, compare and set. Like in C++, you used uh, to be forced to uh, use like vendor-specific extensions, some libraries. It was not part of the language. It became part of the language in C++ uh, only recently. And that's why when you start reading literature on concurrent uh, computing on uh, log free algorithms, you'll often find examples in Java because, because Java has, be, has standardized this kind of code m way longer than, than any other language. So, I mean, that's easy. So we, we have, yeah, we have value, we have compare and set. That, that's all we need. Uh, how we use it? Uh, we use it by replacing our top variable instead of being a variable that we're going to change, it's going to be value, we're not going to change the top itself. Instead, it's going to contain atomic reference, and we'll be using this atomic reference. It won't change itself, but we'll be updating it. And the way you write log free algorithms is by following this pattern. So we read the current value and we're using get. We decide how we want to update it. In this case, we want to create a new node with pointing to the value we just read with our value, and we'll try to perform this atomic update through compare and set. And if it's successful, we return. If it's not successful, we just loop. And we just loop as it's successful. We just retry until we successfully push it. And this pattern is, you'll find it in almost every log-free algorithm. It's a really powerful pattern because it lets us uh, solve the problem of concurrently modified data structure without using any log whatsoever. And so that's the, the, the real power of log free, you know. And the, but the pattern is simple. Uh, we can similarly write pop. I mean, it's, it's, I, I won't go step by step here, but it's the same idea. We read the current value, we try to update it next. If successful, we return value. If not, we try. But notice that here, to write this, we're using atomic reference class. And I mean, let's remember why we started doing log free. So our end goal in this presentation is to make a scalable application, and a, a scalable somewhat implies it's, it's going to be fast. But by using atomic reference, we kind of created another layer in direction. Instead of just working with the top variable directly, we've created yet another object, atomic reference, and we're constantly indirectly going uh, there by, by, by reference to another object, which might be okay for this small example, but in larger application, we'll have lots of concurrent objects that might be, might be a performance problem. So, so it's a trap here that, that we, need, we need to solve it somehow. There are two solutions. First of all, what we would like to do is we would like to be able to directly modify node, and there's actually a volatile modif modifier in Java or volatile annotation Kotlin that you can uh, use to specify that I'm going to modify variable uh, from multiple threads and it's, uh, it's uh, going to ensure all the correct memory semantics for you. But how you, I actually do compare and set? I can read and write it, but how do I compare and set operations that they need for this atomic update? One solution is uh, a class called atomic reference updater, which also defines this Java in 5. And uh, Java 1.5, and uh, it's uh, it's pretty ugly class in the sense that you know it's even its signatures look scary, and when you use it, you have to. And I'll give you an example in Java because there's new ugly code, and that's why they're in, in Java. So uh, you, you'll have to define volatile variable 
and uh, you'll have to define static field and that's using with new updater get your reference to updater, which is pretty big amount of boilerplate. It doesn't even fit on my slide horizontally. And then in the code, when I need to use compare and set, instead of writing it naturally, like I want to update top, I'm writing very in natural style, I'm using this constant to call compare and set, passing read, so it, it just doesn't look like, it looks like boilerplate, not like a real code. But it works. It lets me avoid this extra, extra field. And the other solution has appeared just recently. It's uh, appeared in Java 9. And Java 9 has the thing called var handle. That's a new, new abstraction, Java 9. Uh, it's, uh, it's somewhat similar to atomic reference update in the sense that you also can compare and set through it and use it in a very similar way, just the code even more angular. You have to write even more boilerplate to use it. So, I mean, uh, unfortunately, that's kind of regress in this respect. Uh, but it, you have to write more boilerplate to initialize it. It looks similar, more boilerplate, but uh, then you use it again in the same ugly way. It just doesn't look natural. Uh, since I, I, I write lots of log free code and this concurrent code and it's part of my day job, and I, I can stay, when you start coding in Kotlin, you, you, start, uh, you start to notice all this boilerplate, you know, because there's so much less boilerplate in Kotlin code, so you, you kind of try to eschew it as much as possible. So I wrote this very simple library called Atomic Foo. So instead of going through this boilerplate, I can just write top as if it was an atomic reference. Um, I just have a nice uh, function called Atomic that, uh, that writes me like it's real compact way to declare the fact that top should be atomic variable that contains node maybe null and it's initially null. The, and then I just use it just like I did with atomic reference. So I uh, use top compare and set, and that's it. That's, but the trick is that I code it like atomic reference, and I compile it into Java bytecode just like wrote. But then there is a bytecode post processor who actually turns this code into uh, code that using atomic reference field updater. So behind the scenes is, so I don't have to write this boilerplate, and I let the tool write this boilerplate for me. And that's, that's, that's kind of what, what kind of the progress in, you know, computer programming, what's about. You're, as, you know, you go into higher level of abstraction, you let tools do boilerplate for you. You don't write it yourself. The good thing about it, that without changing my source, I can turn, flip and switch and have it emit the code that using war handle. So I, I don't have to change a single line of my code for that. Of course, the question is, is was it worth it? Okay, so we did it all the step. We learned how to write lock free stack. Even, we even learned how to write it so it's nice, you know, and can work around different APIs. But at the end, like why? What's, what's, did, did we win anything? So let's measure it. And uh, when we measure it, you know, the results won't look, they, they kind of mixed. So for single thread case, there's a definitely a win. And that's one advantage of log for algorithms, that they just have more, uh, more uh, they're more performant uh, when there's no contention in a single thread case. But unfortunately, it's kind of in contention case, we're losing a lot. It should become, we're working, it's now working much worse than it worked with logs. Uh, so why? Why is that? While the one thread case faster is obvious because we don't have logs, it's just much less overhead. But, but why we're having such worse results, like f several times uh, less operations per second in the many threads case? So the reason is that log free algorithms also suffer from contention, but they suffer in a different way. Because when log free, two log free operations overlap, the second one not just waits uh, until the first one completes, it wastes the whole work it tries to do. It, because it tries to update, but then encounters that the other thread won the race and did it uh, did it before, so it has to retry the whole operation. So uh, the effect of contention on log preparation is much more pronounced. And there, of course, there are lots of techniques uh, to alleviate the problem. There are lots of papers on how to make your log for algorithm basically by doing uh, tricks like, you know, uh, exponential back off, uh, proper spinning, et cetera, et cetera. There is various combiners, lots of papers that applying these or that techniques in certain situation, well, uh, you can actually uh, get performance of log for algorithms on par with synchronized algorithm while still keeping uh, this uh, good case of being fast in non-contended case. 
but we're not going to go into there. I mean, because usually in practice, you'll never need these advanced techniques. And I'll show you why. Uh, first of all, let's see whether we had our problem is to toy. Like we, first of all, we've looked at the toy problem to start with. The stack is not something you'll typically work with. Typically, uh, your data structures are way more complex than just a stack. You have some maybe, you know, code database that you update concurrently or something else that, uh, that is in updating it is, takes much more time. So let's try to simulate it. Let's, let's add, let's uh, take it more real by, you know, artificially inflating the time of our concurrent operation by just spending some time inside. We'll do this f both for our algorithm with locks and the same change for our lock for implementation. And let's see how they behave. That's what we see. Because we've, our operations became longer, we don't, uh, we, we don't see much difference in their single thread performance anymore. Because this overhead of locks is now small compared uh, to the uh, cost of operation itself. But we still see that lock-free algorithms uh, don't shine here. Under contention, the same rule kicks in. You know, under contention, locks degrade, but now they degrade like there's no this uh, strange deep at two thread case. Uh, but, and they stay pretty constant, degrade but stay pretty constant. And lock-free algorithms degrade under contention because, again, the same problem. They have to retry operation, which has now became more complex. But there's, by the way, less less difference in their performance somewhat. So I promise you that lock-free should be good. So what's, what's the reason? Let's try to look at a workload. Whether this workload really representative of what we do with our uh, data structures. And of course it's not, because usually when we have this big data problem that updates in real time, usually it updates occasionally uh, compared to the number of queries and reads that you're doing against it. And that's, that's really common p p pattern when you face uh, this uh, updating big data problem because if the data is big, you know, only small bits of pieces of it update. So every piece of data updates relatively rare compared to the number of virus reports and read operations that have to, uh, that have to uh, see what the current value is. So real workloads are mostly read-dominated. So in order to simulate this, we'll add, we'll add uh, in our operation, we'll, uh, between push and pop, we'll do some reads. We'll peek at the top of the stack, make sure it's one there. Uh, we'll do it 10 times. So in this going to 10 to one, basically. Uh, 10 reads per, per, per two updates, actually in our workload, and the peak operation for synchronized implementation is, is easy. We just, we just read top value, or if it's null, return null. For log-free implementation, that's also easy. We do the same change. Add, uh, you know, readers and implement peak. For log-free, it's especially simple implementation. So let's see what's going on. Now it, the, the picture is totally different. First of all, the throughput of the lock for implementation now significantly outperforming the uh, synchronized implementation, significantly. Second, they now catch up uh, under increasing number of thre threads. And that's, that's clear demonstrates where lock-free algorithms shine. Lock-free algorithms shine in read-dominated workloads. When you read your data much more often than you update them, because with lock-free uh, reads don't never, there's no loop, there's no uh, reads in lock-free algorithm never suffer from contention. They just read the current value. While reads of the synchronized data structure that's protected by locks, they have to suffer. They, they, they have to wait until the writers change their modifications. And it's not, you see, it's not that, you know, some people think, oh, no problem, I'll just remove synchronized from my reads. It's not that simple because ability to remove this synchronized memory, it vastly depends on what data structure it is. It basically depends on whether you can do it at least semi-log free. And can, can you issue the logs for reading? For example, if you take the regular hash map that's in the GDK, and you think, oh, you know, synchronizing on every 
hash maps get expensive, let's just leave synchronization on when I put into hash map and leave all my hash map gets non-synchronized for performance because, you know, because it doesn't let me scale. Uh, and uh, you'll find that it just doesn't work. I mean, uh, I've, I've seen instances in production where people forgetting to synchronize and read and, uh, you know, hash map just hangs at some mo moment. When you're starting to read without uh, synchronization, you end up in some crazy states where a read that is not synchronized just, just hands, went into the infinite loop. So not every structure, unless the data structure is designed to allow log-free reads, you cannot just say, okay, I don't need logs on reading it. See, but let's see, it's interesting to see what happens if it's even more read-dominated, if we have 100 reads. You see that the log-free becomes even better. Like, it's now clear, clear outperforms uh, synchronized implementation. But see, we still have this deep. It's still one thread, the faster. More threads, you know, slower. But where's the scalability? So the, the whole topic of the talk was scale up. And here I show you the more threads you add, <laughs> the slower everything works. So then what was the point of having this huge 30 to hardware threads machine to run these codes if, if just adding more threads just makes everything slower. The reason is that, again, the workload we have is artificial. In reality, you never have like all your threads badger into the single data structure. That's never the case. When, you know, if you have a shared data, uh, that's shared mutable data in your code, you usually read something from it, then you do something with it. You do some computation, processing. It's not like you read it, read it, read it constantly. It's never like that. And you don't update it constantly. It's never like that. You, you receive some data from network parses, then update. You receive some request, read some data, do some processing, reply. You know, it's never, you know, could never badger us into the single, you know, single data search all the time. So workload that we've been measuring so far is completely non-representative of the actual workloads you'll encounter in practice. In practice, your workloads will look something like this. That's the best thing we can model the real life workloads in this, in, as a micro test. So we'll just consume some CPU between you know, every read to simulate the fact that in real application, you're doing something instead of just reading. And of course, we'll do this for all our uh, both, uh, you know, lock-free and uh, uh, linked implementation. And uh, let's see what, what happens. And that's, we, that's where we clearly see the scale up that I initially promised you. Uh, because you see here that now, actually both for linked stack and for lock-free, as I increase the number of threads, when I run my code, I get more operations per second because, you know, uh, I, I, they can do more of those processing concurrently. And you see that in those more real-world scenarios, scalability of lock-free clearly better than scalability of link stack. They start, now they start at the same point because compared to the cost of the other CPU expense of the other operation, it's, it's the same. I mean, they're minor uh, compared uh, to the, uh, you know, to the spin that we've added. But as number of threads increase, we see that scalability of lock file is clearly, uh, clearly better. And we actually guess how many hardware threads our machine has, because you see it increases in with logs up until we have 30 of the threads and so it flats after that, because I mean, there's no reason to having more threads than like with six, with the, the machine I was running that on, has just 32 threads, so adding uh, physical, you know, hardware threads. So adding more, you know, uh, threads because all our threads are consuming CPU. They need adding more does not do any good. But the good thing is it doesn't harm either. On the real uh, size number of threads, we don't see any decline when we oversubscribe our machine. And that's very important for practical applications because, you know, in practice, if, especially if you program with threads in GVM world, you, you might, for various reasons, might have way more threads than you have CPU cores. For example, I've been 
uh, when working on various enterprise applications, I've seen applications that run hundreds of threads in, on machines that support only 64 hardware threads. Uh, and that's normal because uh, you, you, might, you might need those hundreds to, to work with database or with other blocking operations. But at the same time, in my application, I have some shared data structures like the constantly update, and I want to read them to do various <coughs> analytics, like figuring out what the uh, current stock price is. And for those, you know, I, I, I want it to scale. I don't want access to the shared data to slow down the, the rest of my work. And I want it as little, uh, as little barrier as possible. And that's, that's good that, you know, as number of threads include, it, it doesn't become worse. Uh, so the, the kind of a lesson here is that we need, when we measure performance, we need to make sure we ask the right question. Is the most challenging, actually, task into measuring performance, especially concurrent code. And especially if you're trying to assess such fleeting characteristics like scalability, is ask the right questions. And like modeling your workload is, is really exercise that pays off. So if you are into, into the task of making sure your code scales, uh, I mean, don't uh, never, you know, uh, don't think like you, you can just you know, omit this exercise of trying to model your workflow. I mean, modeling workflow is important because if you don't model your workflow correctly, you're not getting the right answers out of your measurements. And then when you have a right model for your workflow, you know, you can, then you can compare with those implementations and see that if you have a redominated workload under real life condition, log-free algorithms often outperform the, the algorithms with logs. And if you want to learn more about that, uh, this is two great books I would recommend. The one is Java Concurrency and pra Practice by Brian. Uh, it's really a good book for practitioners with the only downside that it has examples in Java that's are slightly too verbose. Uh, but I mean, they're easily to translate in Kotlin uh, and you know, save you a lot of typing. But, and the other book is more from the theoretical standpoint, The Art of Multiprocessor Programming by Helo Hishavit, and it goes deeper into the theory of concurrency, explains lots of interesting and non-trivial log-free algorithms in a deeper way. Uh, so for anyone who's interested, what to, that's two books in either order. You can start with either one, depending on how your mind works, like you're more theoretically or practically inclined. Uh, they're two good, co complement each other really well, and uh, really, nice read. And some links at the end, so I mean, I hope the slides will be posted. So uh, the GMH that I've used for benchmarking, the, the reference to Kotlin that I use my examples, and uh, Atomic Food that lets me write it all in a nice, you know, concise way. And I'm open to questions. Yeah. The benchmark, the GMH, uh, you run it with the number of threads you want, and it will just run as, as many threads as you ask it for. Uh, you know, because my state is scope per benchmark, there is a scope benchmark annotation, so it will share the state between all the threads. And it just... The, the well is operations per second. So invocations of my, this is, this is my benchmark method. And the metric I show is op operations. Operation is one invocation of this, this function. Number of methods successfully completed method calls per second. That's the, that's the measurement. That's the just default. In GMH, you can configure what you want to see. You can see like how many nanoseconds or microseconds it took. But default is uh, operations per second. Yeah, there are lots of, no, of course, there are lots of ways. I mean, actually, if you read this book, uh, there's a whole chapter on virus techniques to make it better. There's a whole chapter. I mean, I just, just this presentation is too small to go. My, my goal was to, uh, to get interested. If, and if you want to know how to do it, just read this book. Excuse me? Yeah. Yep. 
There is a lot of libraries. First of all, Java library contains some of the log-free algorithms in the standard library, like uh, concurrent hashes map and, and, and others, concurrent skip list. Uh, so, but the, the, what, I, what I found from a practical experience, and if you face a real life problem, the problem is log-free algorithms, uh, they don't compose. So if somebody gave me uh, you know, ready to use concurrent hash map, and I have a slightly different problem, like some operation that it doesn't natively support. I cannot, unlike, I cannot just extend it. There's no way. I have to rewrite the whole data structure from scratch. So in practice, when you face scalability challenges in real life, you almost always find that no existing concurrent data structure solves your problem the way you want, and you still have to write it from scratch. And again, this doesn't happen often, because most of the time you just write the code, just works. I mean, in any type of application, most of the code just is not performance sensitive at all. There's at most 1% of your code that needs this attention to scalability and performance, and usually writing something specifically, if, if again, if your business domain is where performance matters, if you care about scalability, if you want to, analyze this real-time big data workloads, then it usually pays off in writing, uh, in writing your own customized implementation. Oh, that's, that's a really hard question. I mean, uh, there's, it's, it's a thriving area of research, and there's lots of, uh, of formal methods uh, to produce those proof. Uh, the problem with all the formal methods that, uh, first of all, they don't scale to big complex algorithms. The second problem is, like, you write in some special language your code, then you have a prover that would prove your code. But then, the complex problem is how you translate this proven algorithm into the actual code. How you make sure you have not introduced any bugs, bugs while, while making the switch. So, so what's more a practical, pragmatical question is, how do I test that is correct. And for this purpose, there was a bunch of frameworks. Actually, there is, I don't have a link. There is, if you Google, uh, for example, uh, there is link check tool, uh, open source, that so for example, check linearizability of your data structures and uh, multiple threads. It's not, it doesn't prove you anything, but it lets you quickly find common, common bugs that you did. And while previously working in the experts, I've been, I've been involved in its design, you know, and uh, creation of this tool. So, but not to really, there is nothing end to end that from, you know, design to unfortunately. And that's still open question. Hopefully somebody solves it some point in the future. Yep. Uh, it's a, it's a J Java, if you, uh, if you replace the synchronized with, uh, uh, with Latin words, my synchronized. So you can, yeah, you can replace synchronized with uh, Java's oriented lock. You'll get approximately the same performance. I mean, because inside they're very similar. I mean, it just synchronized, uh, it's just uh, less code. And uh, with oriented lock, actually in Kotlin there is a nice extension so you can do it with lock. Blah, blah. So it's, it's actually using rendered lock is way more comfortable in Kotlin because of the DSL nature of Kotlin. So you write much less code because in Java it just very, very robust boilerplate. So in Java, you would usually use synchronize just because using rendered lock, it just produces lines and lines of boilerplate. In Kotlin, it is not a big problem, but uh, from the scalability standpoint, y there is no win. Uh, the reason why people would use rendered lock is totally different. The reason why people would use rendered lock is if they want, if they uh, having very complex data structure with lots of locks, which is a challenge to design because you have to make sure that you don't run into deadlock, and they want to hand over locking. They want to take one lock, then another, then you release the first one. There's no way you can do it with Java synchronized, but with rendered lock you can do it because you can control in your invocations of lock open lock. But from performance standpoint, there is, there is no win from scalability. Yeah, you can do read write locking. There is there is approach. Yeah, there is there is actually there is a thing called read write lock. So you can use a separate you can do read lock, but the, the problem with read write locks it's 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 as those of overhead. So you still get this locking overhead, even though you increase concurrency by read locks, that's another techniques. So basically when you run into scalability problems in locks, one thing is go lock free, the other is go read write locks. So this is too different. Sometimes, you know, if it's data structure is very complex. Uh, complex data structures are hard to implement lock-free away. 
I mean, I mean, there is some limit on how a complicated structure can be to make it log free. So usually the rule of thumb is this, if your structure is simple enough so you can make it log free, just make it log free. If you cannot make it log free, then, but you still have to scale, and then you would go with read write logs.